Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our weekly Torah Parsha class. This week, we're going to be re- learning the portion of Shlach. Shlach is a fascinating portion. I'll give you the context. <coughs> The story of Shlach happens about a year and two months after the Jews leave Egypt. We learned last week that they left Mount Sinai on the 20th of Eir. On the 20th of Eir, which is about a year and a month after they left Egypt or just about a year after they received the Torah, minus 10 days. And at this point, God was looking to get them into Israel within a few days. They were hopefully going to go right in. That's it. Made a few stops. They made a few, a little complaint here, a complaint there, which we read yesterday, and held a few things up. But on the 29th of Sivan, which was about 40 days after they left Mount Sinai, they tell Moses that they want to, before they actually go to Israel, they want to send a group of men to see, to spy, to scout, to tour the land, to see the uh, proper way of uh, conquer. The best strategic plan to conquer the land because Conquering the land, as we will learn in the book of Joshua, was no small matter. They had to go to battle with 31 different kingdoms. And it was fighting. It was, it was war. It was all-out war in many cases. And it wasn't simple. <coughs> so they said, let's, try to, let's figure out the best way to conquer the land. So they send these, well, say they, say they ask Moshe about this, and Moshe asks God, should he do this? And Moshe, God says, I'm leaving that decision to you. That I'm leaving to you. You decide if you want to do it, do it. And if you get my blessing. If you don't want it, then it's fine. And Moshe goes ahead and does it. Sends the 12 men, picks one man from each tribe, and he sends them off. And they go to the land of it. He gives them some instruction what to look for exactly, you know. And they go ahead and they they, they tour the land for 40 days. And then they come back. They came back on the eighth day of the month of Av. The day before, the afternoon before Tisha B'Av, they arrive back at the Jewish camp. And they bring them from the fruit and they tell them, they give them a detailed report as exactly as they were asked to do. But instead of just giving a report what they saw, they started giving opinions also. And they opined on the, uh, on the whole plan of going to Israel. They said, we should not go. The whole idea of going to take over the land of Israel is a bad idea. And you're never going to be able to conquer that land. It's... There's giants there. There's, there's fortified cities. It's, it's, it's forget about it. It's not going to happen. We're not strong enough to do it. And they completely and utterly demoralize the Jewish people to the point where there's a rebellion. <coughs> Such a rebellion that not only did they tell Moses we don't want to go, but they actually threw planning a coup against Moses to overthrow Moses' leadership. They basically said, let's appoint a new leader and go back to Egypt. This whole plan was ill-advised, we're not, well, that's it. We've got to change course and go backwards. Now, this was ten of the two men. The other two, which was Yehoshua, Joshua, and Caleb, or Kalev in Hebrew, Kalev said he spoke up. He asked for the mic, and he spoke up. And he tells the Jews, don't... Uh, Rashi tells us something very interesting, that he, he quieted everyone down. You know, when you have to quiet a mob, what do you do? It turned into a mob. What are you doing? You want to turn, uh, you know, the, the, you want to quiet down the mob. 
So you have to, what, what was the mob all riled up about Moses, right? He messed us up. We're going, he took us out of Egypt, and we're going not to Israel to get killed over there, you know. The, so he began to speak. But how do you quiet down so many hundreds of maybe thousands of people where they're all O'Reilly? So he began to tell them, oh, you think this is the only thing that Moses did? Like he was trying to get that. He makes them think that he's going to now even magna or, or you know talk more against Moshe. So he gets them quiet. They want to hear that. Right? That's what they want to hear. And then he begins to give them a speech of glorifying Moses. He tells them, what are you talking about? The man that took us out of Egypt and split the sea for us and brought us down the manna from heaven every day. You're worried about him being able to, and God, and so on. Then they want to stone him. They were going to stone them. And at this point, Joshua and Kalev collapse. Moses collapses. He falls on his face. And he realizes that is a ma- this is a major, major crisis. And in fact, it was, because God told Moses that he, he's had enough with these Jews, because this is already after the golden calf, just less than a year, ago, a year earlier. And he says, yeah, that's it, I'm done with them. I'm finishing up, I'm going to kill them all, and that's it. But again, Moshe, as he loves the Jewish people more than anything, he asks for forgiveness again, which we know he had. And he says, you know, again, he tells God, what are you going to do, kill them? What, the, what are the Egyptians going to say? Because he couldn't bring them into Israel, so he got rid of them in the land. You're not going to look good. This is not going to make you look good if you kill them. So God says, you know what, I won't kill them, but I won't take them into Israel either. They don't deserve to go to Israel. And instead, I'm going to have them wander in the desert for 40 years. And why 40? Because they went for 40 days on a journey to Israel, one year per day punishment and when the 40 years end and every last Jew that's alive today who's over 20 will be dead then the next generation will merit and I'll take them into Israel and that's how it happened actually that night was Tisha B'Av. and Hashem said they were all crying the Jews were crying and wailing and they were depressed and it was terrible so God said to Moses you see this look at this mark this down in your calendar this night these people are crying for no reason this night, I'm going to give them reason to cry. Tisha B'Av forever became a terrible, terrible day in the Jewish calendar. That's the day the first temple was destroyed and a million people got killed. That's the day the second temple got destroyed and another million Jews got killed. And that was the day that the first world the war broke out, which eventually led to the second world war, which was really one following the other. And all the atrocities and everything bad that happened to the Jewish people happened in Tisha B'Av. Because of that one night that the Jews cried for no reason. Because there was really no reason to cry. Now one of the things that called that the tenth the tenth spy said that we can't go to Israel. Why? Because in their words, Kichazak Hu Mimen. What does Kichazak Hu Mimenu mean? Because it is they're too strong for him. What does Mimenu mean? For him. Who's for him? They said that even God can't contend with these with the people of Canaan. It's too strong for God. That's in a nutshell what happens in this week's Torah today. Now, when you analyze the story, it was one of the most difficult episodes to understand. How could this be? When they say that the, it's too strong for God to conquer, these are people who are now one year after they left Egypt, one year after they received the Torah, a few hours after they got their lunch from heaven. The manna fell from heaven that morning for them. The water is pouring out of a rock to, to, to give them to drink that day all as well. They were living miracle after miracle after miracle. I mean, they saw how God was able to do whatever he wants for them. He got them out of Egypt, which Egypt was a superpower then, much stronger than the Canaanites. Egypt was the superpower. In fact, it says 
that God has, arranges it, that wherever Jews have to be exiled, it should be in the superpower of the time. Why? So that it, it shouldn't look bad to them. Imagine the Jews were downtrodden in Madagascar. That would look terrible for them, even worse than if we were downtrodden in Russia. At least in Russia, you could say it's a superpower, so they subjugate the Jewish people. You know, that it made, it's, it's, it's bad, but it's understood. You know, they're under the subjugation of a power. But imagine they're under the subjugation of a nobody. <clears throat> so God always arranges it that they should be subjugated under a superpower, which means that if they were slaves in Egypt for 400 years, that means that they were the superpower of the time. Much stronger than Canaan. However, and yet, God takes them out of Egypt with, uh, like there's nothing doing, right? Blood, frogs, lies to all, all the ten plagues. He splits the sea. This all happened. They all saw it with their own eyes. It's not like you and I. We heard about it. We learn about it. They saw this. This was their life. This was their experience. So where does this questioning of God come into this conversation? Where does where does this weakness come from? And what happened over here? Now you can still you can simply say they were primitives and they didn't know what they know. Yeah, they were. Four hundred years of slavery. No. They were not primitives. These were people that saw God at Mount Sinai. They went through. They, 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 you know, they, these were sophisticated, holy, spiritual people. And they had a year of this experience. And they had a whole year of this experience. They're eating manna from heaven. Manna from heaven is the type of food that is so refined that says that the Torah can only be given to the people who ate manna. The Torah was only able to be given to people who ate manna. Why? Because the manna was so refined. It was a food that had no waste. You know that there was no waste from the manna. That's what bothered. Was one of the things that they were <laughs> that scared them. <laughs> what was going to happen? They go blow it up and they just blow. You know, it was like a balloon. It just nothing comes out. It's all going in. Nothing comes out. What's going to happen? What's meant to happen? It will blow up one day. They got scared of it. It was like so unnatural. But the point is that it was a very spiritual type of food. It was a refined, godly food. That that became their very physical. The, the physical properties of their body were being nourished by a spiritual food. It was a, it was a physical substance, but it was more spiritual than physical. And this is what they're eating. This is what they're drinking. And they're questioning whether God can conquer the land of Israel. What is going on over here? Now, you could say they were primitive, stupid, they were foolish. They, they, they were not foolish. These were very special holy people, and they were the tribe's leaders, these ten men. And even the regular popular, even the common man was already on a higher level. So this, this whole story begs for serious clarification. So let me share with you what's going on. <coughs> the spies, these ten men, which were truly holy spiritual people, made a terrible mistake. What was their mistake? To understand where did they go wrong? They went wrong in the following in the following thought process. They came out of Egypt with a mission. What was the mission that they were, they were given? The mission that they were given was to be God's people on earth, to be God's ambassadors, so to say, to be the chosen people. What does it mean to be the chosen people? To bring a message of godliness, to be that conduit, or if you will, or that link between heaven and earth. There they are, they got the Torah from Mount Sinai. They heard the word of God himself. They heard God speak to them by, all by themselves. They saw it. What's their mission? To be holy. What did God tell them at Mount Sinai? I want you to be holy. You should be a treasured nation to me. What does it mean to be holy? This, my friends, is where the first instance of the big debate of what it means to be holy was being debated at this point. The spies were holy people. Otherwise, Moshe wouldn't have chosen them to represent the people. These 
the leaders of their tribes. It's not, that's not, they were no small people. They went to Israel and they saw, they saw a new reality. They saw people planting, plowing, working, raising their children in that kind of environment. They walked, they went, they went the length and breadth of the land of Israel. They analyzed everything. <coughs> and they said to themselves and to the people like this, they said to Moses, Israel is not for us. Why is Israel not for us? Till now, their experience in the desert was one of holiness. Learning Torah, was, was there any obstruction to their learning of Torah? Any distractions? None at all. They wake up in the morning, they go out for five minutes, collect a little mana, bring it in, they got the day's business taken care of. What did they do the rest of the day? The more studious ones and the more sophisticated ones went to Moses' tent and learned with him. Can you imagine sitting at this chair as Moses himself? Could you imagine that? And they had that every day, if they wanted. And if it wasn't Moses, they had Aaron. And they didn't have Aaron, they had the sons and the 70 elders. They had the most unbelievable people to learn with them all day long. There was no, 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 no worries whatsoever. That's holiness. You can immerse yourself in diving, you can immerse yourself in learning without any worry under the sun. You could be godly, you could be, a, that is holiness. And they're not wrong. You can't, it's, they're not even wrong when you think about it. They are absolutely right. So you told us on Mount Sinai, they turned to Moses, you, we heard it from your mouth. You said to us, you should be a treasured nation. You should be holy. We're getting the Ten Commandments and the whole Torah to bring holiness, to live a holy life, to live a godly life. And now you want us to go to that place that we just saw. You never saw, we saw it. We saw what the life over there is like. What do you do for a living? We saw people that have to go and do studies on, and then and, and, uh, what is it that you do? Like yeah, serious, what's it? Money. What do you do? No, but you do, you do, don't you do reports? Yeah. Yeah. Do inspection. We say, they said we went to Israel. We saw Jeff Kimmel do inspections 10 hours a day. And we saw Steve Feynman fight with lawyers and fight with judges the whole day long. And we saw Ben Ness work on computer programs and uh, Howard and this one and that. We saw people living their lives. We saw people plowing. We saw people riding tractors. We saw people building houses and people. And they turned to Moses and says, is this what you had in mind? Is this what God said on Mount Sinai that the holy people should be doing? Is that the definition of holiness? In other words, they were saying something. That's one thing. In other words, they were saying it's impossible to be, to live the ideal of Judaism in a place that, that doesn't, is not conducive for it. We don't, there's no time to learn it. There's no time to dive in there. I know what's going to happen, they told Moses. We're going to go to shul in the morning, and there's going to be, they're going to come 7 o'clock and dive in, and the chazan is going to go a little slow, and everyone's going to start screaming, no, we got to get to work already, go quicker. <laughs> That's what you want? Is that what you is that your definition of being a holy and a and a godly people? Over here, anyone's rushing us to get through davening? Here we take our time. We have to dab, we daven as long as we want, we learn as long as we want, we learn the best teachers. That... You're gonna end all that. So they're not afraid of a of a plow. They're not afraid of a tractor. What they're basically telling Moshe and the Jewish people, basically they're arguing with them and saying, we can do that, but then take the whole Sinai ID and shelve it. It ain't happening in Israel. That's not where you live this Sinai ideal. It's impossible. You can't have both worlds at the same time. That's impossible. In other words, they weren't questioning if God can make miracles. They saw it with their own eyes. They said, 
God can make miracles? Of course he can make miracles. We, we, and we're living that miraculous lifestyle right now. But in the world of miracles, God makes miracles, which is the desert. But if God wants us to go live in a land of nature, then God set the rules for nature. He set those rules for nature. Nature demands a 10 hour a day work. Nature demands distractions. Nature demands very little spiritual ability. So you're telling me that God is going to make miracles in Israel? It's, he, he's, it's too strong for him too. What do they mean it's too strong? It's, it's too strong for him. What they meant to say is it's not, it's not too strong. If he wants to turn Israel into a desert, he could do that. That we know. We don't have a doubt about that. If he wants to turn Israel into the desert, of course God can do that. But God wants Israel to be a place of earthliness, a place that's run by the rules of nature. So he's not going to be able to take nature and turn it around to become non <coughs> beyond nature. He made a decision. That's the place of natural, the natural order. And in the natural order, land is no place for Sinai people, for Sinaic people. That's not where you, where, you, where you can conduct yourself as a holy people. That's not a place where godliness can shine and can thrive. It's not. That's not a place where you're going to be able to rise and elevate and transformation and so on. It's just not. So when they say it's too strong for God, they're not denying that God can make miracles. What they're saying is God made a decision that that's a place of uh, th that's not a place of miracles. He wants us to work for 10 hours. If he wants us to work for 10 hours a day, tell me exactly how am I supposed to be spiritual? How is God going to make that happen? It's not that he can't. He doesn't want to, in other words. That's, these are the rules of nature. So how do you expect us to be a godly people in a, in a, in a land that is so ungodly, by God's choice, by the way? This was no joke. This was no simple debate. Aisha fell on his face. He realized that this is, uh, this is, it's either, you know, what, what, what happens now? How do you turn this around? In other words, they did not want to get involved in, in materialistic pursuits because the material and the spiritual to them were a dichotomy. They were two opposites. You can't have both at the same time is what they were saying. You can eat mana and learn Torah, yeah. But you can't eat bread from the earth and learn Torah and thrive in Judaism at the same time. That's not possible. Are they right? One second. Yeah, go ahead. So, I mean, it's a very interesting, uh, very interesting point. But the whole point of what they've already learned in <coughs> Shemitah and the preceding breath and Shemitah the laws and so they're learning supposedly on how it's going to be. So it wouldn't have been a shock to them that that's where they're going to be. So, but when they saw it, right, right. So when happened. they saw it, they said, "Oh, wait a minute! It's impossible. It's going to be a real life. This doesn't change work. Life. Real life does because not the happen. whole point of, of these other till then it was theoretical. Is how to make that physical it was all nature theoretical. holy? It was all theoretical. Yeah. When they saw it with their own eyes, they said, "This doesn't add up on paper." This doesn't matter. But I want to ask you furthermore. I want to go one step further. They said to Meishi, even if we, who saw the miracles in Egypt, who saw the miracles of Sinai, even if we can manage to go into Israel and devote ourselves to God because we're still under that tremendous, tremendous influence of, 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 of Sinai and so on, we can manage to work 10 hours a day and still be Jewish. What about our kids? What about 200 years from now? People who never had Sinai, never saw the Exodus, never saw any of these miracles. How are they going to remain Jewish and committed if we go to Israel with them? Now I ask you, are they right or wrong? If you're there, if you're in the desert listening to this debate happen, and the word got around like wildfire, everyone came running, well, well what's going on here? And they went, this was a real question, this was not a... This wasn't a thing that you can, uh, your Moshe says, hey, knock on the table, says, don't worry about it, it's all taken care of, I'll be, I'll, you know, I'll take care of business. 
<clears throat> this was no, this was a real serious question of philosoph philosophical debate. What would you say? Are they, were they right or wrong? Looking today, were they right or wrong? Wrong. wrong. Why were they wrong? Um, I well, I, you know, let me magnify the question. Take a look around today. How many kids are in Jewish school? How many Jewish kids are in Jewish school? How many Jewish kids, how many Jews today of the 15 million are committed to Jewish life? Are they wrong or are they right? The ones that are not. The spies I'm talking about. Were they right or were they wrong? One can make an objective yes, argument yes, that they're yes. not so wrong. They weren't idiots. They weren't Rishoyim, evil people that were coming to undo a godly plan and so on because they were lazy because they were this. They were looking into the future with very, very good lenses and they were saying, this ain't going to work. This is impossible to manage. It's not going to work. It's impossible to have both worlds at the same time. You can't put overalls and put a guy on a tractor and expect him to be spiritually inclined. It's not possible. That was their argument. If you want holiness, it's going to have to be in the desert, not in a land of milk and honey. Truth doesn't matter. It's a function of what God wants. It's not the point. What, the, what they would, that's exactly, oh, now you're getting to the key. They argued with Moshe, what does God want? God wants us to be holy or does he want us to be earthly? They would, this was the debate. This is exactly what the question was. What does God ultimately want? They, what they said, God said what he wants. He wants us to be holy. He wants us to be spiritually inclined with our eyes up to heaven, not our eyes down to earth. Animals face to earth. Be humans face upwards. Does he want us to be earthly or does he want us to be heavenly? He wants us to be heavenly. You got to eat manna and learn Torah. You can't worry they do, do inspections on the house and expect the Jew to be holy. But God provides man right up until he doesn't. Right. So if God if God decides we're getting off mana, yeah. we're getting to real life now, yeah. everybody, you know, it's been good, but, you know. So don't I tell think, us that we should be holy. That's what he's saying. You know, I think if you want us to be holy, that's not where you'd be holy. That's what he was saying. That's what they were saying. You can't have it both ways. That's the point here. You either want to be us to be holy or earthly. And that's not holy. When you put on overalls and get on to attractive for 10 hours a day, you're not holy. Don't tell me that's holiness. That's the argument. Is that holy? Is that the definition of holiness? It can be. Or the distraction of having to, to live by your labor, right? And all the stress and all that that, that it takes, that it definitely take away from the ability to do quote unquote the holy thing. They're saying. Right. And they're not wrong. No. I can't point to that what he's been trained on. Based on what you taught me. Well they were arguing with him about oh, that. Well in a sense they had their view. But the question is whether he was supposed to make that decision or not. Was it Shem wanted? Shem wanted this or he wanted to be part of the church. He wanted a relationship with the elite and in the church. <coughs> not to be in a little bubble where he's doing everything for everybody. That's not going to spread uh, and how holy are you as a result? How holy are you as a result? And me, and him, and him, and everyone else. No, yeah. Zero. No, serious. No, no, no. Some process. Maybe more. Why do you say zero? I think more. That doesn't mean you're not holy. The po my, my point is, let's be objective about this. How holy are most people today as a result of going out of the desert and into the land? You can make an argument that the spies were not so wrong. However, here's where they were wrong. <clears throat> here's where they were wrong. They were wrong in the entire definition of what holiness means. This is where the big question was. They were so far apart from where Moses was and from where God was in this whole concept and this but this requires explanation this requires understanding here's what God said at Mount Sinai I want I'm giving you 613 commandments like you said before you're going to have Shemitah the sabbatical year you're going to have the cities of refuge you're going to have Tefillin you're going to have Tzitzis you're going to have a Sukkah you're going to have a Lulu you're going to have Matzah you're going to have marriage you're going to have divorce you're going to have ch re children rearing you can have it all. Do 
Is that holy? It's holy. What's holy about it? You see, if holiness means to be an angel in the, a higher world, there's no definite no question that is holiness. Angels are very holy. Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. They dance around in holiness all day long. They love. They love. That's what the angels do. And the, the, the spies wanted to be like angels. That was their understanding of holiness. Angels. Those, that's holy. At Mount Sinai, a radical shift in the whole way of thinking about God and the world was meant to set into the Jewish consciousness. And it took, by the way, what was the result of the story of the spies? God says, you know what? I'm going to give what they asked for. They want to stay in the desert for, for the rest of their life? No problem. Stay here for the rest of your life. We'll start with another generation. We'll take them into the land of Israel. They got what they wanted, really, when you think about it. The difference is, they got it after they realized their mistake, and that's trouble. That's a mess. But God said, you know what? If that's how they understand holiness, they didn't in other words, in other words, they failed to understand the radical shift or the radical message that was meant to be conveyed at Mount Sinai when God came down to the mountain and rested his presence on the physical mountain. What God was doing with that. He was saying to the Jewish people, the whole world is changing now. Till now, for the first two and a half thousand years of the creation of the world, holiness was in heaven. <clears throat> when Abraham was told by God, sacrifice your son Yitzchak, what do you think Abraham felt at the moment? Oh my God, I'm killing my son, this is terrible. I want to argue that he said, God, that's great, can I come along? Yitzchak was j jumping for joy. I, I can leave this miserable physical world of unholiness and go to a place of holiness because these two people wanted to be holy. And they couldn't for the life of them figure out how do you be holy on earth. There's no way to be holy on earth. This is a sick place for holy people. So when God tells Mother, tell Abraham, by the way, you can send your kid up. That's great. He must have been thinking, can I come along for the ride? That was the world till Mount Sinai. People like Abraham, which were naturally inclined to holiness, found no outlet to their holy spiritual quest here on earth. They couldn't figure out, how can I live a holy life here on earth? They couldn't. They didn't know how to do it. So he spread godliness and he was teaching about God because he knew the truth. But he had. how do you make this world a holy world? You couldn't. God at Mount Sinai was teaching and sending a new message to the world. From now on, holiness is not going to be in heaven. It's going to be here on earth. I'm going to teach you how to be holy, how to bring me, my essence, my holiness down to earth. How? You take a piece of skin of an animal and you transform it into tefillin and you put it on your hand and head every morning and you connect with me that way. You took the animal and you turned it into a piece of godliness. You take a lulav and an esrog on sukkahs, it's a piece of a date palm, a date tree, a branch of a date tree with a citrus fruit that grows somewhere in Italy or, or in Israel, and with a myrtle and a willow, and you bring them together, make a blessing. This became a shtig getlechkeit, a piece of godliness, a piece of holiness. And through one esrog, we make the whole vegetation world holy. And imagine millions of esrogs. And then you have all the other 613 mitzvahs. You get onto your tractor and you plow the field and you give 10% to the poor man the way God wants it. Or to the Levite and to the Kohen. And then you make a bracha on that food and then you give charity with your food, with your money. And then all these things. And then you get married and you have, you create children. And these are all physical things that God gives you a laser beam of light that tells you how to sanctify every last bit of it. It looks like a restriction. I can't do this, I can't do that. It's a laser beam of light telling us exactly how to bring energy of holiness into your physical life. The spies missed that important thing. 
They got one thing, they forgot the second. In other words, there were two messages at Mount Sinai. One message is, you Jews are becoming holy people. Oh, great. We love that. In Israel, we were building cities. Now we're going to learn Torah. That's great. But the second message, how to make holiness happen. And what, happened, what was the message? God brought heaven onto the Mount Sinai. And he gave them mitzvahs. Mitzvahs means physical action. That's what mitzvahs are. They're all physical things. There are very few mitzvahs that are not physical. Love God, fear God. Those are spiritually mitzvahs. But even then, they have to be done with the heart. With yourself, with your consciousness, with your mind, your heart, your emotions. But we can. I'll give it to you. There are five, six mitzvahs that are not physically oriented. But the other 607 are. Spies go to Israel and they say to Philip, this is a <coughs> tractor trailer, life on earth. Sounds like a nice idea, but it ain't going to work. It's just impossible. And you can't even blame them when you think about it. I mean, you can blame them. He went against God. He's rebellious. Of course, you can blame them. But let me also say, but a year after they left Egypt, a year after they got the Torah, to, <coughs> to be able to properly capture the message, the radical message. This is a radical shift. Understand that. It's two and a half thousand years, the world is in one way, and all of a sudden, in an instant, it changes. And God says, heaven is not going to be on earth. This is where you're going to find me. Not in heaven, over here on earth. It's a major, major shift of thinking. It took time. They failed. I want to go further in this thought. Go ahead. A little far fetched, but is there a book? Pharaoh, who was the leader, his heart was hardened by the shock. He saw the suffering of his people, all the plagues, and still his heart was hardened where he couldn't see clearly. Could that have happened to have changed leaders who were holy? No, he would never do that. Why would Hashem do that? Because Pharaoh was a sinner. He deserved to take what that was part of the punishment that God took away the ability for him to repent after so much sin. The spies weren't happy, didn't have that. This was their volition. This was their sin that they did, they committed. It was their mistake, it was their failure. Failure. And the whole people failed. Turned everyone against God, they, because it was so, it was so radical what happened at Mount Sinai. We don't appreciate the radical shift that took place at Mount Sinai. In the words of the Medrash, the Medrash says that God said, <coughs> "Until now, when God created the world, He made a split between heaven and earth. Heaven is holy, spiritual; earth is physical, and those two would not merge. That means the domain of God was in heaven." The domain of man was on earth. And that's how the world ran for two and a half thousand years. And suddenly, God says, I'm, 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 I'm doing away with that split. Heaven can now become one with earth. You can put on that overalls and get onto your tractor and be godly. That did not resonate so easily with the people. And how could it? They never experienced it. How could it? That not only experienced it, it didn't make sense. What does that mean? To, to spend all day long in planting and planting and, and working, and that's holiness? Yeah, that's holiness. But that's where you bring God into this world. And ultimately, that's what God He wanted to have his dwelling place here in the nethermost unholy world. Now, as, as strange as it sounds, and really when you think about it, how much time do we have for true holiness? Like when I say true holiness, I mean the natural holiness, davening, learning. We have no time for that. We get 10, 15 minutes after davening to learn a mission. We're all happy. Wow, this is great. Come at night, you're falling asleep here, another class of Torah. That's a major accomplishment. If you come learn every day, once a week, if you can. And even once a day, it's an hour out of 24. It's, it's nothing. 
that's what it made. That's what it is. But God wants us to bring holiness into the egg. Holiness into your vegetables. Holiness into your meat. Holiness into your bedroom. Holiness into your kitchen. Holiness even into your bathroom. way, next week we're going to learn the portion of Korah. I may not be here next Sunday, so I'll teach you a little about Korah too. <coughs> now that story follows exactly this story. What happens in next week's portion? Korah leads a mutiny <coughs> against Moses and Aaron. What does he tell the people? Why you all, who are you, and what makes you mad and us, and you're this and that and the other. You know, you took all the positions of leadership for your family, and he starts to rebelling and getting there. Question is, when did Moshe and Aaron become the leader? When did he become the leader? On the first day of Nisan, Aaron became the high priest. Moses became the leader already a year early when they left Egypt. When did Korach come with his complaint against Moses and Aaron? In the in late summer, in the fall, like a six months later. Where was he till then? If you didn't like the fact that Moshe became the leader and Mo, Aaron became the high priest, you should have come the day later and said, what is going on over here? Why do you wait a half a year or more, for Moses even more? The Rebbe explains it beautifully. He explains it, he says, only after the spies did Korah complain become a real complaint. Till the story of the spies, what was the understanding of holiness, of the Jewish mission in life? Learn, become spiritually inclined and grow spiritually, right? Every under person understands that Moses spiritually is much more than me and you spiritually. So of course he's going to be the leader. And of course Aaron is the high priest. He's a holy man. But now that Moshe teaches the Jewish people after the episode of the spies and says, Holiness is not about climbing a ladder and going up to heaven and reaching your own spirituality, but to bring heaven into a, into a, into a matzah, to bring heaven into a lulav, to bring God into your dollar when you give it to charity. Korah says, who makes you holier than us? We all do the same thing. I give a dollar to charity. I give money to charity. I shake a lulav on, on sukkot. I eat in a sukkah on sukkahs, just like Moshe. We're all holy. That's what he said. Kulam gedoshim. We're all holy. Why are you higher than us? If the whole purpose was as Moshe's message is now, that the holiness is in mitzvahs, in putting on overalls and getting onto a tractor and letting and giving charity from our money, the Tom, Dick, and Harry does that just as good as Moses does it. So now all of a sudden he's telling Moses, why did you become the leader? How did, why are you even higher than us? You're not. This was a very sophisticated debate that was going on over here, these two portions. And one follows the other. You understand what Korach is saying now? Korach is making a real serious argument. <coughs> He's saying, till now, I was okay with your leadership. It made perfect sense. In a place where we're all becoming one with God on, on, on a spiritual plane, Moses' soul was much higher than my soul. I, everyone knew that. And therefore, there was no question that Moshe was on a higher level, and therefore he should be the leader. But if your message is that we all made a mistake till now, we thought that holiness is that kind of holiness, and you're really telling me that his holiness is in mitzvahs, in marriage, in a Shabbos meal, in a lulav, in, in, in very, very mundane or materialistic things, this is every Jew is holy. If that's the case, we're all holy. He's not wrong. What does Moshe tell him? What's the answer? This is how Moshe gets rid of him. <laughs> he tells God, you got to get this, you know, you got to finish with this. You got to put this mutiny to an end immediately. And then that happens. The over the earth swallows them all up, and that's the end of it. But what's the answer to Korah's explain? You know, you can't just kill people and figure and think that that's going to be the end to the problem. And in fact, right after that happens, the people start complaining. You just killed people. You didn't give us an answer. 
You can't just shut people's mouths by killing them. You know, people that kill political opponents, what do you think they do? They accomplish anything? You don't accomplish anything. The argument is the same argument. What is the answer to Koyach's mitzvah? Is your mitzvah different than Moshe's mitzvah? Ben, you had a question? Um, previously, what yeah. could you do to explain to the people in the <coughs> desert that this is what Hashem wants for them? He did. Moshe did. That's what he did. That's what he did. continue to do? Well, it was a, it was a, it was it took time to really it should, that it should resonate with the people. It's one thing you tell people theoretically a concept, and then when they go to Israel and see it for their own eyes, they say, this ain't going to work. This makes no sense to us. Until Moshe crystallizes the message and says, that's exactly what God wants, that you should not learn all day long. You should work with the physical world and transform that into holiness. That's his ultimate goal. So Kera comes and says, if that's the goal, we're all doing that. We, maybe I can do better than Moshe. So let me see Moshe get on that tractor. <laughs> the regular commoner could get on that tractor and make the world, you know, and, and work the land and make a, the land of Israel a, 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 a habitable place. Better than Moshe, probably. Basically, or just as good as, you know what I'm saying? Nothing less. The mitzvahs are the same. What's the answer, my friends? The answer is that the mitzvahs have to be my mitzvah and Moshe's mitzvah are very different mitzvahs. If you're considering the physical action, they're the same. When a tzaddik puts on film and regular people put on film, it's the same box. It's the same God's coming down to the animal heart. I'll call you in a minute. If you're talking about godliness being transforming the animal hide, your film and his film are the same. That's the same, nothing. It's all the same. But, but here's the thing. God wants a dwelling place, right? What's a dwelling place? A home. A home. So let's say we build a home. Imagine you built a home and the architect forgot to put... We've got an electrical engineer and there's no electric in the house. We've got to put lights in the house. Goodness gracious, there's no lights in the house. It's a house. There's no doubt. You, well, you go to your, your inspection, you bring a flashlight. You pay the, the moldings are there and the paint is perfect and there's asphalt. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the, you know, the bricks, everything is there. You have beautiful furniture, the beautiful home. We forgot one thing. There's no electricity, no light. So could you say the home that was built with light and the home that built without light are both a home? You could sleep there, you could be there, but it's not exactly a, 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 a comfortable home for you. So when you put on film, you're creating the home for God. When a tzaddik puts on film, he's also creating a home for God. But the tzaddik, because he has so much fervor, so much passion in his so much soulfulness in this mitzvah. What happens to that lot, to that house that he creates for God is that the house is a lit up home. It's full of light. That's a home where God is much more comfortable than if it's in a dark house. You and I put on film, we're thinking about the World Cup, we're thinking about the next house that I have to do an inspection, when can I get out of the shul already, the guy's taking his time. And you came late, and they go, no, 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 you know, right? That's a home. It's film turned into a home for God, no question about it. But, you know, the electricity is a little bit, you know, <laughs> it's not, you know, it's like the air conditioning in this room. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, you know, it's not so comfortable to be in that home. So Meisha tells Kaira, you're right, we're all creating a home for God, but there is a higher home. Hierarchy is extremely important. It's also, it's also who God chooses, whether it's a prophet, also, a king. Right, but what's, the, but what's behind that choice? Yeah. Because the prophet, the, 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 the 
tzadik, Rebbe, Moshe Rabbeinu, the Holy Moshe, his mitzvah is a mitzvah just like yours. There's so much electricity in that mitzvah. It makes the mitzvah so much more meaningful. And that's why he's the leader. We'll continue on that theme next time. Any questions? In other words, these two portions, these two portions merge these two attitudes and make them one. The, the spies are right. You need a spiritual fervor in your life. And therefore, Moshe has to be the leader. Korach messed up. What the spies got messed up is they wanted only the light. They didn't want the bricks in the house. They wanted just light. Korach just wanted a bricks in a home. Moshe says you need the light. You need the, the first thing you need is the home, but you need a good electrician to make good light and good spiritual spirituality in that home. You, your tefillin should burst with spiritual passion. It shouldn't be a dark house. And that's these two portions coming together. And that's why they can only follow one after the other. Because the argument is that you need a house for God, you need this tractor trailer, plowing and, and, and planting and making a home for God in the physical. You need a land of Israel, not the desert, but you need Moshe there. You gotta have, a, you gotta lighten up that house if God's gonna be comfortable there. So you got to work on your spirituality as well. So the story with the spies and the story with Korach makes for perfect symmetry where the whole Judaism becomes a real, a real experience of reaching up to heaven and bringing heaven down to earth. That's your call. Have a good week, everyone. We'll see you.